اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم صلی اللہ علیہ یا رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ و اہل بیت کل معصومی ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين Chapter 12, Surah Yusuf, verse number 7 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان في يوسف وإخوته آية للسائلين إذ قالوا ليوسف وأخوه أحب إلى أبينا منا ونحن عصبا ونحن عصبة إن أبانا لفي ضلال مبين So in your gathering with remembrance upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Azimina Rasulullah, recite the second salawat. For Allah to shower onto this gathering with His infinite mercy and compassion, and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. By far, the greatest institution in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the religion of Islam is the institution of family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put great emphasis within the Holy Quran on family. And the religion of Islam, brothers and sisters, two people may be in harmony and in agreement with each other. And they decide that of the opposite gender, I mean in a romantic relationship, that they decide to live with each other. What would be the problem? He's okay with it. I'm okay with it. We can live together for years. And then maybe down the line, we decide that we're going to get married. But until then, we live in harmony and peace together. And this is something that you see in the West, and very often, more so now than before. Why? Because in some states, the richer the state, the higher the divorce rate. In California, 
which is the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world, California can become an independent country on its own, you would think that people are happier and families last longer. But the divorce rate is now more than 50%. More than half of marriages result into a divorce. So people end up saying, you know, we could just live together. We don't need to get married. And that is unacceptable in the religion of Islam. Why? Because when two people to come together in the religion of Islam, they come together under the witness and the eyes of God. And those eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one can escape. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees us. He's a witness to us. We cannot escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes. That is why with a few words, one becomes mahram to his significant other. And with a few words, one becomes na mahram again to his significant other. So what's the purpose of those few words? I mean, is that such a big deal to say the ceremony? The big deal is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then becomes a witness to this union and He blesses this union. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says every family is blessed. Once a family is established under the eyes of God, it is blessed. It receives blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man goes to one of our imams. He says, Yabna Rasulullah. Can I marry a woman who is married, but she is non-Muslim? He says, yes, out of people of Ahl al-Kitab, Christians and Jews. He says, you cannot marry her, because she's already married. But I don't, I don't, I thought they don't believe in what we believe. He said, even their marriage is blessed. Even their union is blessed under the eyes of Allah. Then he says, okay, what about an atheist? Two atheist people are married, but they are married. Would I, be, would I be able to marry the wife? If she, for example, does not receive a divorce, but she just separates. The imam says, even they, even those individuals you cannot do that with. Why? But they're atheists. Allah blesses the union and marriage of even the atheists. Because Allah loves family. Allah loves the structure of family. The greatest ibadah in the religion of Islam is to give attention to your family. In fact, people would come, women would come and complain to Rasulullah, to Amir al muminin my husband spends more time in the masjid. My husband spends more time in ibadah. My husband sometimes neglects me and the home and he spends time in worship. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood firmly against this practice. And he says to those individuals that have become holier than thou, we want to become holier than the Prophet. We want to become holier than the chosen ones by Allah. So Rasulullah called all of those guys. This was a new trend of people who just sit and worship and fast and they pray and they don't work and they don't take care of their families and they don't give attention to their spouse. He called them, he said, come. Who am I? They said, you are Rasulullah. What does that mean? You are the last final messenger of God. He says, listen, I spend time with my wife. I see my wives. I enjoy life. I eat. I take care of my home. You cannot be neglecting your family on the expense, using the excuse of God and religion. Then he says this, خيركم, you want to be good? 
You want to be above others in the day of judgment? خيركم خيركم لأهله. The best of you are the ones who are the best to their children, to their families, to their homes. خيركم خيركم لأهله. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an entire chapter in the Holy Qur'an. In many occasions, Allah speaks of family issues and family values and family affairs in the Holy Qur'an. Starting with Surah Al-Baqarah, you will find that the issues pertaining family are constantly repeated and addressed in the Holy Qur'an all the way until the end of the Qur'an. Surah Al-Baqarah, it is named Baqarah, not because it's named after the cow, but it bec it's named after the incident of the cow. And the incident of the cow was a murder within a family. A murder that took place within a family. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the family of Al Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the affairs and the family of Maryam and Zakaria. Allah addresses the example of Ibrahim. He gives the example of Ya'qub. He gives the... But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down an entire chapter in the Holy Quran discussing the details of the life of the Prophet Yusuf, his father Ya'qub and his sons and the brothers of Yusuf. And indeed, this is a chapter in the Holy Quran that we must often revisit. We may know the story, however, there are details, beautiful details in the chapter and the ayat that we need to constantly revisit. Because they give remedy and solution to our problems today. In a day and age, especially for those living in the West, where the institution of family itself is in jeopardy, family structure is in jeopardy. Within this chapter, Allah discusses a few notions. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within this chapter clearly discusses the notion of jealousy within families. You know, this is a, such a taboo topic. People are not willing to really discuss such a thing. You know, who wants to say my brother is jealous of me, my sister is jealous of me, my cousin is jealous of me, my uncle is jealous of me? Something people don't even want to bring up. However, why is it that Allah brings it up? I said a few nights ago, because this book and the Qur'an and the message of Islam is meant to be relevant. The reason why today the religious institution, you don't see people flocking towards the religious institution, is because unfortunately it's not as relevant. Sometimes you go and you feel like you've gone back 700 years, sometimes more. And then you step out and you're back into reality, you're back into the real world. This is not the case with the Qur'an. The Qur'an is relevant. And the Qur'an addresses real issues. The other day, a few nights ago, I gave examples of the most influential people today in the world. And on social media, the most influential podcasts, the most influential celebrities, the most influential shows, the most influential singers. Believe me you, it's not because, you know, they're very good looking or they're, 
their, you know, the, the graphics on this movie. No, no, no. It's because there is a relevance between the message that is being said and what people feel on daily basis. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this chapter addresses this issue, addresses this phenomenon. That there will be jealousy within the home. In fact, the very first case of jealousy between siblings, you didn't have to wait long after the creation of human beings. Ashabil and Qabil, the first two siblings on the face of the earth, they were jealous. Not just jealous to a point that one of them committed murder against the other. Allah teaches us how we address this jealousy. You know, what do you do? Some people say, you know, I, I'm going to stop going to my brother's home. I'm going to block him on WhatsApp. I don't want to associate with him anymore. Allah says, you can't. But I'm going to give you a solution. Allah says, read this chapter, you find how to deal with such things. And should they be hurting you to an extent where you're losing sleep over this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how we should deal with it. Where you can go home and sleep. You don't have to lose sleep over it. Allah also in this chapter discusses the concept of loneliness. Loneliness, you know the vast majority of people today in the world are either on prescription drugs or recreational drugs because they want to escape a reality called loneliness. Antidepressants, this, that. Some people think, you know, if I go and shop a few thousand dollars, I'll feel good about myself. I'm going to escape this loneliness for a while. As soon as they get home, they feel lonely again. You know, how many youth of our youth, your children, our children, when they go to university, they feel lonely. And this is a very dangerous time. In fact, the greatest gift that the religious institution can give to families is to see how we can solve this issue of loneliness for our college students, for our beloved children. Because we want them to do good in school, and we want them to be successful, and we want them to stay away from harm's way. But how? Some people believe that one way to escape loneliness is to be married, and then to have children, and then to have a lot of children, and to be in the middle of the family, and the family's gotta be very large, and you know, every single day we visit each other and we have, you know, large feasts. And we are then not lonely anymore. Yeah, of course, family helps. Family is very important. But Allah here addresses even a bigger phenomenon. Someone who is lonely with a very large family. Someone who is lonely like Yusuf, he was taken by his own brothers who were meant to protect him, to safeguard him, to love him, and they threw him in the well. And when they did and they found Yusuf in the well, they went to dig for water, they found him there, this beautiful young boy. They came, they said, oh, this boy, yeah, he used to be a slave, he belongs to us. You sell him? Yeah, I will sell him. How much are you willing? They sold him for very cheap. When they did, Jibrail, he went to Yusuf. He says, Yusuf, you know, I want to accompany you in this time. I know it's going to be very lonely for you. You have 11 brothers who backstabbed you, who threw you in the well. Your father as an influential man and a prophet of Allah, and you have a very large family, your whole clan, and now you're lonely. So I'm gonna accompany you, don't worry. 
And Yusuf was smiling. Jibra'il says, why are you smiling? He says, Jibra'il, I don't need you. I'm okay. He says, what do you mean? How are you okay? He says, because when I was coming here, I felt, who's going to touch me? Who's going to disrespect me? Who's going to put me in harm's way? I have 11 brothers. My father is Yaqub. We own the whole village. When they took me and they threw, the, threw me in the well, of course, essentially, I was, initially I was saddened, I was depressed, I was hurt, I was crying. But then I had a wow moment of my life. A moment of realization, a moment that we should all pray for. And that is, I don't have anyone besides Allah, but I have Allah, I don't need anyone. Allah is with me. إِنَّ مَعْيَ Rabbi as Musa says. And Rasulullah tells his companion, إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعْنَا We have Allah. Why should we be afraid? When the troops were coming towards the people of Bani Israel, and they were impoverished people, and Pharaoh resembled the most powerful man at the time, the most powerful army at the time, the most powerful government at the time. No one can dare to go against Pharaoh. Pharaoh was, you know, modern day NATO plus all the other big armies around the world. And he decides to go after this Musa, who's a nobody, who decides to defy him. And the grounds are shaking underneath Bani Israel. They're shivering. And suddenly they, had, they hit the Red Sea. From one end, Musa and Pharaoh is behind them with all his might as his troops. And the ground is shaking underneath of them. And now they've hit the Red Sea. They're going to be destroyed, annihilated. So they come to Musa, Ya Musa. What should we do? She says, nothing. Musa, are you not scared? I'm not scared. What do you mean you're not scared? How can you not be scared? He says, I'm not scared. Why? Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us. Allah is a witness. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah is capable of everything and anything. And look at this Iman of Musa. That moments later, the greatest superpower of the world was annihilated instead. They came to annihilate Musa, but Allah annihilated them. Subhanallah. Not only that, Musa was saved. And Allah takes the body of Fir'aun and He says, I want him to be a lesson for the rest of the Fir'auns. Because there's going to be many Fir'auns. I want him to be a lesson for, for all the other Pharaohs. But the problem is, Pharaohs, they don't read the Quran. <laughs> and if they read the Quran, they don't understand it. They think it speaks to somebody else. But Allah says, this Pharaoh is ayah. He's ayatullah. Ayatullah Pharaoh. Really? But he's a different kind of ayatullah. He doesn't have a risala. His body is a risala. His body is the message. Allah says, I have saved him so that you look at him and you remind yourself, this is the end of a zalim. This is the end of injustice. This is the end of the road for them. So Allah in this chapter, Surah Yusuf chapter 12 makes an emphasis that there are people within the midst of family and large families and influential families, but they will feel lonely. And they will feel miserable as well. Now imagine if you have no family and you say, I'm lonely and miserable. People will say, yeah, come to my house. Let's have dinner. We'll take you out for a coffee. 
But if you have a huge clan and your family is very influential and, and you have you know, plenty of family members around you and you say, I feel lonely, people will say, are you crazy? They are more misunderstood than people who don't have somebody. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this in the Holy Quran. In such a beautiful way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Yusuf also tells us something very important about the human character. That once we become successful, success and money comes with arrogance. So those who have money and those who are successful and humble are the exception to the rule. Even when it comes to religion, if I have money, if I have all the means, Allah in the Quran, if you read the Quran, you find that people will start bending religion to follow their rules. They don't want to follow the rules of religion. Give me a set of rules for me. Because I am special. You know Fir'aun, some people think Fir'aun was against religion. He propagated against religion. In fact, Fir'aun, he was a religious guy. No, really, this is, sounds like a joke, but it's not. He told the people of Bani Israel, you know this Musa and his brother Harun? They're going to corrupt your faith. They're going to corrupt your religion. Fir'aun says to, about Musa, and Harun, that they are the ones that are going to corrupt your faith and religion. Not the other way around. So he used religion. Fir'aun used religion as a front to fight Musa. The, who fought Ibrahim? Who fought Ibrahim? The non-religious guys? No. Actually the religious community fought Ibrahim. That's why he went and he broke the idols. They were the heads of the, you know, this idol worship institution. And he destroyed their idols. And he put the axe in the neck of the big idol. You all know the story. Then they came, they said, who did this? Ibrahim said, well, if you want to know who did it, ask them. Ask this biggest one. So he can't speak. So he can't speak. Well, tough then. I guess you're out of luck. So they said, it must be this guy, Ibrahim. He must have done it. He must have broke the idols. He's mocking us. If somebody mocks me, I could say, you know, it's okay. I'll let it go. It's not a big deal. But if you feel very passionate about this thing, you say, let's take him and throw him in the fire. Some people think that this is a sign of being more religious. That if somebody disagrees with me, I have to take them and throw them in the pits of the fire. And that's what they did. Those guys, they took Ibrahim, they put him, they wanted to throw him in the pits of the fire, but Allah changed it into a garden. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Who fought him? Again. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Again, the religious community, the religious institution. Let's use religion. Again, not, we cannot generalize and say the religion, but the ones who used religion to their advantage. So we worship idols. Idols are the... But you cannot worship idols. There is no common sense. They fought him and they sent him to exile and they put him in Sha'ab Abi Talib and they killed and assassinated all his companions. And 
on the 10th of Muharram, on the 21st of Ramadan, the one who struck Amir al muminin he had this thing on his forehead of namaz. He was the head of the khawarij. He would memorize the Quran and recite Salat al-Layl. Yet he struck Amir al muminin And on the 10th of Muharram, in the midst of the battle of wanting to kill the grandson of Rasulullah, they stood and they did jama'ah prayers. Because some people will want religion to bend towards them. Bring religion to me. I'm not going to go to religion. And make it in a way where it pleases me and it serves my interests. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Yusuf, towards the end of this chapter, that we're going to now open up inshallah our Quran and go to chap to verse 101. Says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yusuf says, after all this journey that you're aware of, and he went through <coughs> many tribulations and many difficulties and all those things. Rabbi, he says, he speaks to Allah towards the end of his life. Rabbi, qad ataytani min al-mulk. Ya Allah, you gave me a kingdom. You made me a powerful man. Wa'allamtani min ta'wil al-ahadith. And you've given me the knowledge of the unseen in terms of interpreting dreams. Because you remember he interpreted the dreams in, in prison. فَاطِرِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The creator of the heavens and the earth. أَنْتَ وَلِيِّ You are my master. أَنْتَ وَلِيِّ فِي الدُّنْيَا You are my master in this dunya. وَالْآخِرَ And in the hereafter. تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا Take me away as Muslim. Muslim means what? Means allow me to remain submissive to you. He says in the beginning, remember, Ya Allah, you've given me a kingdom. How likely is it that a king is going to be humble? How likely is it that somebody with so much power over Egypt is going to be humble? So he says, you've given that to me? Keep me humble. You've given me so much knowledge... Keep me humble. Don't make me arrogant that I have knowledge more than others, especially the knowledge of the unseen. You know, sometimes you have knowledge that other peoples have. Sometimes you have knowledge of the unseen. You know what's going to happen to the stocks markets within the next few months? Huh? How many of you wish you had that knowledge? And if you did, would you stay humble? So he had that knowledge. So he says, Ya Allah, keep me humble. عَلَّمْتَنِي مِنْ تَأْوِيلَ الْحَادِيثِ فَاطَرِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَنْتَ وَلِيِّ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخَرَةِ تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا Keep me as a Muslim, submissive to you, somebody who follows your commands, somebody who submits to your laws. وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ And take me and unite me with the Salihin. Salihin are here his fathers and his forefathers. Who were his fathers? Yusuf ibn, Ya'qub ibn, Ishaq ibn, Ibrahim. Kareem, ibn al-Kareem, ibn al-Kareem, ibn al-Kareem. Four generations of immaculate, pure, noble blood. But he says, this is not important. Who my father and grandfather and great-grandfather is, is not important. What's important, Ya Allah, is you take me as a Muslim and unite me with my forefathers. With Ibrahim. Now let us go to the beginning of the chapter. A few minutes, inshallah. Verse number four, إِذْ قَالَ يُوسُفُ لِأَبِيهِ يَا أَبَى Yusuf says to his father, يَا أَبَى يَا أَبَى تِئِنِّي رَأَيْتُ أَحَدَ عَشَرَ كَوْكَبًا Eleven stars, والشمس, and the sun, والقمر, and the moon, رَأَيْتُهُمْ لِي سَاجِدِينَ I saw in a dream that eleven stars, the sun, and the moon are prostrating to me. This was the dream, you know, this chapter 12 begins with a dream. Now, some people might ask, 
How important are dreams in Islam? Some people believe dreams are more important than Tawheed, than Nubuwa, than Ma'ad. Every single day they have a dream. Believe me, every year I get thousands of emails. I saw a dream, I saw a dream. I saw a dream, I saw a dream. People call you, I saw a dream. I don't know what people eat before they sleep, you know? You, you got to keep the stomach light. So you don't have so many dreams. You don't occupy so much Maulana time, right? <laughs> and everybody wants an interpretation to their dream. Baba, your dream doesn't mean nothing. It means nothing. Go back to sleep. No, but Allah says dreams are very important. How? Chapter 12 of the Holy Quran. Surah Yusuf. Last time I checked, you know Yusuf. So what is the verdict on dreams in Islam? Because this is very important. Allah says that Yusuf saw a dream. And Yusuf was Siddiq. Yusuf was Nabi. So he saw a dream. Allah says, I communicate with chosen individuals via dream sometimes. So I don't have to send Jibra'il to them. I'll send them a dream. Similarly, Allah speaks of another prophet in the Holy Quran who saw a dream. Who? Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibrahim says to his son Ismail, قَالَ يَا بُنَيَّ O my son, إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أذبحك. I saw a dream that you are the sacrifice. فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى What do you think? قَالَ أَبَتِي He says to him, Oh my father, قَالَ يَا أَبَتِي فَعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ سَتَجِدُنِي إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ Execute the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You shall find me amongst the patient ones. Allah speaks of another dream in the Holy Quran. لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا لَتَدْخُلُنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ Allah speaks of Rasulullah's dream that he will liberate Mecca. But when he went to liberate Mecca and he could not enter Mecca, what happened? Sulh, Hudaybiya. Rasulullah told his companions, get up, we're going to go and do Umrah. They got ready, they went, they didn't do Umrah. They were intercepted by the mushrikeen. Rasulullah took out a paper and pen, he called the mushriks, they said, let's write a peace treaty. Peace treaty? You told us you were taking, you're taking us to Mecca. We're not going to go, we're going to write a peace treaty. So he wrote a peace treaty on the way back. Some of his companions told him, we have doubt in your nubuwa. Because you told us that you're going to go to Mecca. And we didn't go to Mecca. So we don't know, are you real? Are you not real? What's the story? So Allah descends this ayah. That's, it's real. You will go to Mecca. And Rasulullah saw this dream. Do you have to? You know, because sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with giving us. When He gives us, we think, oh, it's a reward. It's, it's a test. Some people don't realize that Allah's giving is a test. Allah's taking and delaying is also a test. But we're happier when Allah tests us, we're giving, not withdrawing. Versus the test of giving is much more difficult than withdrawing, withholding. So Allah says, in times do, this has been withheld. You will enter Mecca. You will liberate Mecca. And Rasulullah did enter Mecca and he did liberate Mecca. So Allah talks about the dream of Rasulullah, the dream of Ibrahim. And the dream of Yusuf. He says, if you are a ma'soom, if you are a chosen one, yes indeed, your dream is a communication with Allah. What about me, you mu'mineen, anybody? Rasulullah has asked, Ya Rasulullah, what about my dream? What about our dream? 
Rasulullah differentiates a dream that a sadiq, a ru'ya sadiqa and a ru'ya al-kathiba. A true dream and a false dream. One way, there are many ways to distinguish. One way is if you see this dream in the time of Fajr. Around this time. And before sunrise. This is the time where you are given, we are given the time of experiencing a message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People who, play, who recite the Qur'an before they go to sleep. People who are in wudu and a state of tahara going to sleep. People who sometimes do the mustahabbat. One of the easiest mustahabbat is tasbihat al-zahra. Takes less than 60 seconds. Right? You can do that before you go to sleep. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may communicate with the mu'mineen, but not every day. Even Ibrahim was not seeing a dream every day in, in wahi. Right? He saw it once. So let's not spend so much time and worry and stress about dream, 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 dream. You had a bad dream? Give sadaqah. You had a bad dream, don't talk about it to other people. Those, those are not what I'm, this is not my personal advice. It's the advice of Ahlul Bayt. Give sadaqah, ask Allah to repel evil if, it, it, if it's stressing you out, no problem. And continue to live your life. If you want to spend time learning about something, learn this book. Learn the Quran. Learn Nahjul Balagha. Learn the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. This is very in the very beginning of the ayah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter in ayah number seven, Lakat kana fi Yusuf wa ikhwatihi ayatun lissa'ilin. And Yusuf and his brother, there are many lessons. There are many lessons, many ayats. They're all ayatullah again. إِذْ قَالُوا لَيُوسُفُ وَأَخُوهُ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَبِيْنَا Yusuf and his brother are more beloved to our father than us. He loves those two, Yusuf and Benjamin or Benjamin. Their mother was Rahila. He loves them more than he loves us. وَنَحْنُ عُصْبَ And we're 11. 11 of us from one mother, another mother. Our father is, he's lost. Then he says, one of them says, this is the mastermind. Uqtulu Yusuf. Allahu Akbar. That's easy, huh? Jealousy. It makes people blind to a point that he's saying, kill him, kill his own brother. Yusuf Or just throw him somewhere far that we cannot find him. So we don't even see him and see his face, and his father doesn't see his face. So somebody here comes and gives a middle ground resolution. Look at this other fool. He says, قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ One of them, in verse 10, لَا تَقْتُلُوا Yusuf. No, 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 don't kill him. لَا تَقْتُلُوا Yusuf. وَأَلْقُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الجب. Instead, throw him in the well. You see, when you're hanging out with the wrong audience, with the wrong crowd, you will not receive good advice. One of them says murder, the other one says no, 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 murder is too much. So you're thinking, well, alhamdulillah, there's one of them, at least he's got some conscience left. He says, no, instead throw him in the well. We have to think about who we associate ourselves with, who we seek advice with, and their influence that will rub off. A few ayat that I want to make reference to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 18 says, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Verse number 18. 
وَجَاءُوا عَلَىٰ قَمِيصِهِ بِدَمٍ كَذِبٍ They came with false blood on his shirt. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ You orchestrated this. He, Ya'qub says to his sons, You orchestrated this. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ أَمْرًا فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ What is between sabr and sabr that is jameel? What is Jameel? Huh? Beautiful, Ahsant. You know, sometimes the Arabs would name people the opposite of, you know, their names. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ It is beautiful. But the opposite of beautiful is what? Ugly, painful. What is more painful? To speak about your misery and your agony or not to speak about it? It's more painful not to speak about it, right? Right? Allah calls that sabrun jameel. Though it is more difficult, it is more painful. But Allah says, if you keep quiet and you don't complain and you have true sabr and you only converse to me about it, you only discuss it with me, فَصَبْرٌ jameel. This is exactly what Yaqub did. When you don't declare your problem to others, when you only speak about it to Allah, it's called sabrun jameel. Fasabrun jameel. How am I going to get out of this? Wallahu al musta'an. Allah will help. Allah will aid. Ala ma tasifun. Again. Yusuf that now goes from one problem to another problem. He goes to Zulaikha's home. He leaves Zulaikha's home. He thinks, you know, now he's going to get a break and he go, ends up in prison. It's not easy. And ayah number 38. He's in prison. He's got two friends in prison. And... He's having a conversation with them. Allah records this conversation in the Holy Quran for me and you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya sahibay as-sijn. Oh my friends of prison. Oh my cellmates. Arbabun mutafarriqoon. Mighty individuals, powerful individuals. To have, to have a very extensive circle of friends that have influence arbabun mutafarriqun khayrun am allah al wahid al qahar or to have one friend who has a lot of influence to have a group of individuals to say i know the president and the prime minister and every other person in the government is arbabun mutafarriqun arbab you know arbab right arbab is somebody with might with power with influence Mutafarriqoon. Is that better? Is it better to have them on your side? Amillah. But to have no one Arbab. But he is Allah. And he is the Rabb of all Rabbs. He is the King of all Kings. Amillah al Wahid al Qahar. That shows that in the most difficult times when you're desperate, you know, they say desperate. Times call for desperate measures. So normally when you don't ask someone for a favor, but now you're desperate, you would. Yusuf is saying, that's not the case with me. I will continue to ask Allah. I will continue to knock at the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one and only. There is another beautiful verse that I want you to take a look at. And that is verse number 53. You know, 
One tendency that we may have is when we sin and when we commit a mistake, sometimes, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, nastajiru billah, we become so arrogant that we don't want to quit it. And if people tell us this is a sin, we try to explain how it's not a sin. Because now we're accustomed to it. Now it's become second nature. I cannot. I remember, you know, I am never, Allah has my witness in the business of shaming anybody or putting them down. So I, if I say this story, it's just an example. A few years ago, I went to a community and I met some of the brothers and a few of them had accumulated tremendous wealth by, sell by selling alcohol, liquor, liquor stores, you know, liquor stores, na'udhu <laughs> billah, they sell liquor and every other, so it's, it's really not the greatest business. And we know it's haram. And we know the money that we earn from it is suht. So I said, you know, what is my responsibility here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold me responsible. He says, you were there. They hosted you. They sat across from you. And you said nothing. And you know, it's the most awkward thing to go to somebody's house and try to tell them what to do as well. So you also want to be respectful. Not that you're afraid, but you're respectful. You're courteous. I mean, they're your hosts. You also want to be kind. But you also want to do your Islamic responsibility. So I alluded, I alluded in an indirect way that, hey, you know, this is haram, this is unacceptable, this is suht. And the tawbah is there. People can do tawbah and repent, and inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. And this is not the response I received. You, Zulaikha, Zulaikha, after the crime that she committed, she says this. Look at this beautiful thing. This is how Allah bestowed tawbah upon Zulaikha. Allah says she had a big mistake, but also a big repentance. So Allah praises her for her repentance, actually. In fact, He brings her story to tell us that she, she has, if somebody is in that position, they should have hope. They will be forgiven and they will also be praised, not only forgiven, but praised for their tawbah. Why? Because the very first sign of a tawbah is you recognize your sin. You recognize your mistake. You don't want to, you know, with arrogance say, no, 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 I, I, this is not a sin. This is not a mistake. Exactly what those individuals that, no, it's not haram. Huh? Selling liquor is not haram? It's not haram. How is it not haram? Did I just wake up in the wrong place at the wrong time that liquor is not haram? Alcohol is not haram. Drinking is not haram. Selling, you know, this kind of magazines in your store. Every, literally most of the things that are made from that kind of business is haram. No, no, it's not haram. Why is it not haram, brother? We don't sell it to Muslims. Ah. Okay, there's always, you know, one way they'll find to make them themselves feel good. But you can't feel, fool Allah. Who can fool Allah? Nobody can fool Allah. Here, Zulaikha doesn't do that. Zulaikha does the exact opposite. Look at what she says. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي After you know, she repented. She says, I'm not going to say I did not make a mistake. I'm not going to say I was the innocent one. I'm not going to accuse Yusuf. I'm not going to go after his reputation. I'm going to own up to this. However, this nafs inside of me called me to a sin. Imam Zain al-Abidin says, Ya Allah, when I sinned and I disobeyed you, it was not because I wanted to disobey you. No, I don't. لَقَدْ سَوَّلَتْ لِي نَفْسِي 
My nafs seduced me and fooled me. What a beautiful way to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am a mu'min and I believe in you and I am a servant. A servant of yours, but I made a mistake. All servants and slaves make a mistake. It was a slip. So this is what Zulaikha says. Sometimes Allah out of his mercy protects us from some sins. Allah out of his rahma protects me and you. We're not put in that position. إِنَّ رَبِّي غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all forgiving. Last one, we look at and we conclude inshaAllah. The rest you go and read at home. Verse 83, it's connected. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ Again, imagine. Ya'qub, the father, he knows his sons took their brother and they threw him in the well. And for years he knows this. How difficult is that brothers and sisters to communicate with those people still? To still advise them? To still live with them? To still look in their eyes every morning? This is one of the moments in the Quran where I just, I can't wrap my head around it. It's too difficult. Too difficult. Eleven brothers gang up on one of them, who is the best of them. They throw him in the well, then they bring it. And the father knows. The first moment he says to them, you're liars. You orchestrated this. But he continues to live with them. And he continues to advise them. And he has patience with them. Imagine the Quran says, this is how much patience you have to have with your children. Don't give up on them. May Allah bestow all the mu'mineen patience with their children. True patience. Really, because it takes a lot of sabr sometimes. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ Allah, here Ya'qub says to his sons. قَالَ بَلْ سَوَّلَتْ لَكُمْ أَنفُسُكُمْ This nafs that Zulaikha was talking about, he mentions here as well. He says, your nafs fooled you. أَمْرًا فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Asallahu and again he talks about the sabr that is Jameel. Asallahu and yatiya bihim. Yatini bihim jami'an inna huwa al alimu al hakim. I am patient and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find a way to unite us all again. 86, 86. He says, Qala innama. أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهُ وَأَعْلَمُ مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that if I only complain to Allah, and if I only go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will open up His doors for me. Brothers and sisters, it is the month of Ramadan. Half of Ramadan is almost done. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, sometimes we can't get it right. As smart as you may be, as smart as you may be in your business, as smart as you may be at your work, sometimes we just can't get it right. We will have problems in the family. In those moments, pray, say, Ya Allah, you help me in my family. I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the ways. You do. Ya Allah, have rahma upon my family. Have mercy upon my family. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this dua he will answer. Saluk Allahumma wa nad'uk. Bismika al-azim al-a'zam al-azz al-ajal al-akram. Ya Allah. Allahumma gfir lil-mu'mineen wal-mu'minat. Wal-muslimin wal-muslimat. Al-ahyai minhum wal-amwat. تابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير وبالإجابة جدير وحسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والعلماء والشهداء وخدمة الحسين أنت all your مرحومين الفاتحة مع الصلوات